Liz and I spent our early married life in, a t- in the town of Columbus, Georgia. And during our time in Columbus, Liz decided that she was gonna go back to school and get her master's degree. And she chose to go back to Columbus State University and pursue a degree in servant leadership. And the main reason she chose this program was because she worked with the founder of the program, Bill Turner. Now, Mr. Turner was the former chairman and CEO of W.C. Bradley Company. He's also the author of The Learning of Love, A Journey Toward Servant Leadership. And in his book, Mr. Turner writes, leadership is an opportunity for service, not an opportunity for power. And it must reach outside the organization in many ways to create a caring community and ultimately to build a better world. Mr. Turner worked tirelessly within W.C. Bradley to build a spirit of personal fulfillment, to unleash people's caring and creativity. But he didn't stop there. He also carried this into his community, onto Fort Benning, the military base, and into the classroom. And one of my favorite parts about, the, about all of this is that Liz was able to sit with him in his office one day and he shared with her that he would meet with each student enrolled in the servant leadership program so that he could share stories about his life, where he had traveled, the ways in which he had helped people all around the world and how he would carry these lessons back to, into his home, work, and community. Liz was inspired by Mr. Turner's dedication to making the world a better place. And in turn, this is why it's so important to Liz that her life is used to do the same, to carry the torch of servant leadership into our own home, to her work, community, and the world. I wonder, can you think of someone that has inspired you to be the person you are today? Who has left their mark on your life? This morning, we find ourselves at the transfiguration of Jesus. And we have Peter's account in our first reading And we have Matthew's account in the gospel. Well, let's start with the gospel, and then we'll come back to 2 Peter. So Jesus finishes telling his disciples what it's going to take in order for them to follow him. He then chooses Peter, James, and John to follow him up yet another mountain. Everyone else could just stay at the bottom and chill and relax, but they had to follow him. And as they reach the top, Jesus is transfigured before them. The scripture says, Jesus shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Jesus shone like the sun. He was light. He was not reflecting light. He was light. Peter, James, and John see Jesus as the uncreated son in his divine nature. Then Moses and Elijah appear. And of course, Peter wants to build tents for the three men, three of them to dwell in because who wouldn't want to just hang out on a mountain with their biggest heroes? Then the voice of God comes from a cloud that had formed. God announces that Jesus is his son and that they should listen to him. The disciples hit the ground in fear. Jesus walks over to them and touches them, tells them to get up. Don't be afraid. And as they they rise, they notice that Jesus is alone. 
And they walk back down the mountain together with instructions to tell no one. Who is the transfiguration for? Like, what was all the dazzling white and the bright lights and the voice of God and Elijah and Moses? Like, what is this for? Was it for Jesus? Did he need to hear again that he was God's son and that God was pleased with him? I don't think so. Jesus' transformation had to be for Peter, James, and John. The transfiguration has nothing to do with Jesus glowing like the sun. It has everything to do with the recognition of God's power to act on the hearts of humanity. God has the power to change our very being and turn us into agents of change in this broken world. The transfiguration has everything to do with the transformation of us and little to do with the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus knew his time was coming to hang on the cross and he needed Peter, James, and John to fully understand and embody his mission to the world. He needs them to understand who he really is. God in the person of Jesus so that they can carry the message. This leads us into 2 Peter. And this letter is written as a plea to a community that has begun to lose hope in Jesus' coming. For them, Jesus has been away too long. 2,000 years later, we are still waiting. So they begin to become unsettled and they turn away from the faith that has been handed down to them. Peter ensures them that Jesus is the real deal. Peter himself was there to witness the transfiguration of Jesus. All they have to do is choose to believe. Choose to be inspired through the testimony of eyewitnesses to Jesus' majesty and power. Jesus will come back. And until then, they are to be living spokespersons filled with hope, witnessing to the power of God in their lives, a light to the world. Peter has passed the torch of hope in Jesus Christ to these people, and he expects them to do the same. Most people when they think about their death, they will put together a will, a document that states how their earthly treasures will be divided. And some people, in addition to their will, will leave an additional document, a witness, a testimony of sorts of their life, what they have learned, how they have lived, and their wishes for how their family will live their lives. This is what the witness of Jesus' transfiguration is for us. It is this witness that makes us agents of God. Jesus knew his time on this earth was limited, and he needed Peter, James, and John to under, understand exactly who he was. And that knowledge would strengthen them to continue the good works begun in them by Jesus. We also need to be strengthened to continue the same work as Peter, James, and John. In our ministry and witness to each other here at St. Andrews, in our home, our work, our community, and in the world. We need to draw our strength from the one who gives us authority to carry out his work, Jesus Christ. Amen.